The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Why were Daniel's people, why were they exiled? Israel, why were they exiled into Babylon? Anybody know? You ready? They were exiled so they could live to be kept. Why is that? God made a declaration that anybody left back in Israel would be destroyed. You know what happened? The priests at the time, who thought they knew the word of God better than any of the prophets, they stayed and died. God specifically said, I exiled you to Babylon so that you could live and all those who were rebellious to the word of Jeremiah died. That's the first thing. That's a head twister, right? See, this is a difference. When you read many chapters, many books of the Bible, you have a context. You can see the whole story. If you read small verses, which is okay, but if you never get to the point where you have read the whole book, you won't have what you have in context. And things sound surprising. I can almost guarantee you that surprised a few people. I mean, God do that. He did. He exiled them so they could live. Then they became a burden to him. They became a burden to God. Anybody know how? Here it is. He sent them to Babylon to be corrected, to be disciplined. But they went into Babylon. They fully integrated into society. And they became prosperous in Babylon. God sent them there for correction. The burden of Babylon, you ever hear that? The daughter of Babylon, you ever hear that? God specifically said in the book of Jeremiah that Israel was one way going to her. But then she adopted the ways of Babylon. They became a burden to him. They messed up his holy days. Right after Babylon, God said, no, I don't, I don't enjoy your feast days. I don't, I don't enjoy your sacrifices. Don't sacrifice things to me. Don't do it. Why? Because they intermingled. They mixed. They integrated. The holiness of the Lord, his holy days, his ways, with those of Babylon. They became prosperous school teachers. Some of them became rich, but the faithful who were exiled there never liked Babylon, kind of like some people today. The ones who were faithful, they prayed every day, Lord, deliver us. The ones who compromised themselves, they didn't want to leave. They invented a new doctrine. They bought it back to Israel. But again, the ones who were faithful, every day in Babylon was like captivity. So I'm saying that to tell you this. There are people right now who are alive, and every day in this world is like captivity. Clearly, people should know by now why they are alive, having read things in the Bible. This is a process of growth. It was never meant to be a paradise. But there are many of God's people who can feel the darkness closing in around them. Where they are, there's no darkness, but they can feel it all around them same thing. Does it mean that everybody else is cursed? No, it does not. But the Lord did say, love not the world. How can a person ever love this world? Well, like we all did. We had nothing to compare it to. We thought it was everything, just like some people think right now. Well, there's only life on earth. That's what they believe. Well, there's only life on the top side of earth, nothing else, you know. That's what they believe. That's all they're exposed to. That's all we had was the earth. That's all we had was the world. And then, of course, when we're introduced to the Lord and His righteousness, that's when the separation begins. That's when you learn what righteousness is compared to what you've been doing. And then you find out, wow, this world is pretty dark. In fact, this world is seemingly designed in a way to keep a person dark. It is. Get back to Israel, then. Israel was exiled to be kept. They came back with a corrupted word, corrupted dates, corrupted everything, and God disciplined them over and over and over again. The actual repair of Israel takes place in the future. That's when they become whole. They're not whole yet. They were broken when Christ came. Did you guys notice? When Christ came. So you can find that in Jeremiah, but you can see the remnants in the declaration of that in the book of uh, Daniel. In the book of Daniel, this figure is coming to the earth to do away with Israel. I want you to know that. 
when they were exiled to Babylon so they could live, who was after everybody that they would die? Uh-oh. Do you guys remember in the book of Jeremiah? Who came through the lands? I mean, utterly laying waste everything. Do you guys remember how powerful Persia became? He became powerful. So powerful, God had a declaration against specifically them. The prince of Persia. That word is chief prince, which implies almost um, someone with a deity status. We're not talking about a human vessel. We're talking about something else. Anywhere you see that word chief prince, it implies a, a, a supernatural power of darkness. Chief prince. In this case, chief prince. So when you have, you have, uh, for example, you have um, Gog and Magog. But do you not know that there is a chief prince that carries the name of Gog and Magog? It is the power behind the place. Persia has a power behind it, behind that place. There is a declaration with Persian prophecy. And when you understand that prophecy, you understand what rises out of Persia. The book of Daniel is so incredibly revealing. I mean incredibly revealing. Especially dealing with the kingdoms of this world. And then who rises? Who does not? Right? The statue of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. You guys remember that? The statue of the four beasts. Listen to this. I'm going to read this out of Daniel 7. Daniel, I, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, this my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. I came near unto the one that stood, stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, made me to know the interpretation of things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Now remember that, there are four kings which come out of the earth. Just four, not four thousand, not forty thousand, just four. There are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Did you hear that? For eternity. We're running there, is it? Let's continue to read. This is Daniel 7. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break into pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns which were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of the horn that had eyes, he's going to tell all, and a mouth speaking great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Let me stop. Daniel 7.20 is also a revelation scripture. Do you guys know that? See, it was in Revelation, we just read in Daniel 7, the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up. And before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. You guys may not realize how much of a diverse time you live in. So I'm going to cover something with you. Let's just break it down like a fraction, shall we? Let me, let me, let me go into this. We're looking at the development of, of, of a beast a beast and this beast is not uh, well he's not he's not a good person I guess you could say he's not, he's not a good one after the war in heaven right Satan was cast out of heaven so listen and I sit upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads and aims of blasphemy and the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard now, if you look in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13, you're going to see the overlap. You're going to see a big overlap. That's what I'm trying to get your... Um, so he, he was, he was, one of his heads, or, or um, I'm, I'm sorry, he was likened to a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, seeing great authority. Listen, the dragon gave him his power, seeing great authority. Revelation 13, 2, the devil gave him his power, his seat in great authority. What are you dealing with? Well, if the devil gave him his power seat in great authority, you're dealing with an earthborn vessel. We're going to break it down today, if you guys just give me the time. Which means, we're talking, this beast, we're talking about a beast. Now, before you go any further, you have to understand what a beast is. By the Bible, not by any other doctrine. 
but by the Bible. You have to know what a beast is. And in order to do that, we're going to need Revelation 17. But let me back up. I'm, I'm going to be using Daniel 7 in and out, back and forth, and Daniel 11, Revelation 13, Revelation 17. I'm going to be using those. All right, because Daniel saw something in a night vision. Daniel 7, 3, and four great beasts came upon, came up from the sea to burst from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings, right? I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on the feet, his feet of a man, his heart was given unto, and behold, another beast, a second like a bear, right? We just saw this. We, didn't we just read about this? Revelation 13, yes, we did. The second was like a bear, and it raised itself up on one side, and had three ribs in its mouth, and in between of the, uh, the teeth of it. And they said, Thus unto it arise, bow much flesh. After this I beheld another, like a leopard. Didn't we see this in Revelation 13? I saw one of the, I, I mean, and the beast, Revelation 13, too, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were his feet of a bear. And his mouth as a mouth of a lion. Same thing. I want you to see the overlaps. So Daniel saying, he saw this thing like a bear, ribs in his mouth. He saw another one like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. And the beast also, right? The beast had also four heads. And dominion was given to it. He had four heads. And dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in a night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strongly, exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Isn't that something? Now, didn't we just, didn't we just read about this? Because he saw one was like unto a leopard, Revelation thirteen two, had the feet of a bear, mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, saying, "Great as art." He's saying he had iron teeth, and it devoured, breaking to pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was the verse from all of the beasts which were before it. And it had ten horns. Same thing in Revelation. So there's a, a great consistency in this, right? Same thing. Same beast. Sometimes, a lot of people will read this forgetting about Revelation. They'll go into detail on what they think this is, but not adding the rest of the scriptures with it. They're quite consistent. There's no contradiction in there. Notice each beast changed. It was altered. Daniel saw the first form of it. And he saw the final form of it. Right? That's what he saw. In the book of Revelation, we see the final form. And we see the whole form of it and its purpose. But let me continue to read in the book of Daniel. For so he sees this. And then he said, I consider the horns. And behold, there came up among them another little horn before whom were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. That's very consistent with Revelation. Why do I say that? Because the beast was given a power, right? He was given a power. He was given a power. Listen to this. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. He was able to make war with man. In this world right now, that mouth is in this world right now. Why? Because this beast is in this world right now. Don't worry, I'm going to clarify. I'm going to get you to see this. Because there is no Antichrist until this beast comes. Now, a lot of people are taught by Hollywood and by people who like Hollywood and some, you know, different doctrine that somebody's going to get shot in the head and come back to life and everybody's going to worship him, right? I never read that in the Word of God, not one time. So let me continue. Daniel saw this and he starts, he, he's given the interpretation of the strength. 717, these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. These four kings are the four, what? Kingdoms, the four kings. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the king forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. This is the important one. Which was the verse from all the others exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were, were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, breaking to pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, 
and of the other which came up, which before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them. It made war with the saints, prevailed against them. It prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. So it did what? It, it prevailed against them until what? Until the Ancient of Days came. You have to realize where you are. You have to realize that. You just heard something that a lot of people will never spend enough time on. I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given unto the saints the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So until God comes, what, what's going to happen? You will not have your paradise. Do you hear me? You will not have your paradise. No one has had their paradise. No one is going to get their paradise until the Ancient of Days comes must realize that they wouldn't be tired, they wouldn't be weak, they wouldn't be defeated because they would stop looking for a paradise and they would get up and fight, fight, fight the good fight of faith. See, because when somebody tells you, hey, we're going to have a good time, but you don't have a good time, it's disappointing. If no one tells you that you're going to have a good time, they say, listen, this, this is going to be tough, but we can do it. In your struggles, you're going to find joy. In the cold nights, you're going to find a closeness with those around you. See, because it's true. Listen, listen. The hardest, the hardest thing people could ever do is attempt to figure out why the bonds of military people, right? Police officers and everybody, why they're so close. I'm going, Let me give you the big secret. Because they die together. Because they struggle together. I know for a fact that families who have struggled together and have continued, nothing can break their bond. Because in the trouble, in the storm, in that difficult situation, that's when the true bonds of brotherhood are made. That's when the bonds of brotherhood are truly made. When it looks bleak everywhere and the only thing you have is each other, that's when the bonds are made. So that when the slightest deliverance comes, you can rejoice together. And I'm going to tell you something. Rejoicing together is just, it's okay by itself. But there's nothing like dying first. That is to say you suffer in a situation and then rejoice after. That is the seal of that brotherhood, of that camaraderie. To this day, I don't believe anybody could ever be closer to me than those I sat in the dirt with, those I fought with, those I was injured with. It's just a special bond that cannot be broken. Why? Because you died with those people. You suffered with them. That's when all the camouflage comes off. And you're a person and they're a person and you connect on such a deep level outside of all the facades of society. It almost makes society become revealed as this perpetuated lie with false mannerisms. It's kind of like history. A set of lies and many have agreed upon but it happens families who have struggled in their youth when you struggle with your brothers and your sisters and yet you stay in that bond is formed you have a true bond but even if people are looking for a paradise they don't get it they're all disappointed and heartbroken bitter that's when you get tired see you can't get tired if you were never looking for something that was never there when you're looking for relaxation paradise that island where you can kick your feet up that plan to come true right where everybody has their idea of of, of, of meeting a specific goal or something like that and when it does not take place you're heartbroken in truth it's almost like running two miles then when you get to the end of the second mile, somebody says, oh, well, we met three. Oh, you're talking about taking the life out of somebody, right? That will always take the life out of somebody. And that is so strong of a turn of strength that is used purposely in training to make people go beyond their own limitations. They'll say, hey, you're going to run eight miles. Give it your best shot at the end of the eight miles. We'll talk. So they run the eight miles and on the eighth mile, you say, oops. You gotta run nine. Some people quit because it's a DA select school. They're out of there, right? They quit, they're done. Some people push hard. The ones who quit, we don't want those folks. 
you, you never want the guy who's just going to make the grade just to pass something. You want the person who's willing to adapt to any new terms and step his foot right into it. That's who you want. In this world, people have told you, right? They told me when I was young, hey, you become a Christian, your problems are over. No, that's not the way God raises us. And that certainly is not what he promised. In fact, he told his apostles to tell us, don't think it's strange when you go through fiery trials. Now we're reading. Now we're reading, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. People, a lot of people, they don't know this is happening right now, that they were born in the middle of it. This is happening right now, I'm going to explain that. Because I know some people don't understand it. You may contest it. Just give me a few minutes. Let me continue to read. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. Right? Now the angel is explaining this. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Now look what's happened. We had many different countries in this world. As of the last 400 years, the whole world has been converted into one place, operating by one standard. This is where you have to, you're going to have to open your mind up for some, well, don't open your mind, just your ears. We have one standard. Let me, let me, you have to think differently. You have to see the world from a kingdom perspective. See, there was a time, not too many hundreds of years ago, when everybody did not have currency, when everybody did not trade the same way, when everybody did not eat the same way, when everybody did not sleep the same way. They didn't live their lives the same way. Right now, they live their lives the same way. They eat the same way. They get from one place to the other the exact same way. One place. One kingdom. Why do I say one kingdom? Okay, here it is. We have a global standard in currency, don't we? Doesn't matter what, what type dollar bill or, de, or denomination of currency you have. You have to have it to do things. And you have to do the same. Everybody's paying rent. Everybody's paying something like a mortgage. Everybody is going to the grocery store. Everybody is buying fuel. Everybody is doing this. This is one place. Not a bunch of places. This is one kingdom. Not a bunch of kingdoms. One. Everybody is utilizing the internet. Everybody has a phone. Everybody knows what a bank is. Everybody knows what a credit card is. Isn't that something? You gotta step back in a kingdom perspective and see this the way your father is teaching it. You cannot see the word of God the way man teaches. You have to see it the way your father's teaching you. So take a step back out of your country and see that everything is the same. We're all doing the same thing. It is one kingdom. One kingdom. You hear me? One kingdom. I hope you guys can see this. And the ten horns of this kingdom are the ten kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. This king is going to speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of times. Now, here's where the, confu the, the, the part of confusion comes in. I'm telling you right now, this kingdom is here already. It's been here. Nobody builds the kingdom of the beast overnight. See the king. You, in, in Revelation it says what? Revelation 13, when I stood upon the sand and sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, and aims of blasphemy. Listen. And the beast which I saw was like to a leopard, his feet, feet of a bear, mouth, mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. So it had to be there first. And then the power, seat, and great authority was transferred to it. His uncanny ability to cause whatever he wanted to prosper. That's, what, that's what's been happening. If the dragon gives anything its power, seeing great authority, if he just gives it his power, seeing great authority, then you better believe whatever he just gave it to is going to carry out 
his agenda. Now, what are you fighting in the world? What do you see happening in the world? You see remnants of this war all the time. You see the saints and the Most High being wore out. How? By policy. That's how. You don't want half the policies they have, but they came anyway. There are many things that are against righteousness. They exist anyway. They go forward anyway. Do you hear me? That's wearing out the saints of the Most High. It is when the world is not very inviting to Christ. You saw the Ten Commandments come down. You saw the name of Jesus be stricken from usage in certain places. You saw the doctrine change. You saw the mandate change. You saw the holidays regarding Christ change. You saw Easter turn into a fairy tale right before your eyes. You saw it. You see what they're doing. And how can they be so prosperous and get away with this stuff? Because the dragon has given them his power, his seat, and his great authority. Right here on this earth. See, people forget about that. They forget. Let me continue to read, though. It says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall, and shall wear out the saints the Most High, and to think to change times and laws. They shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and, hap and dividing of times. But judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom of the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my consultations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, and I kept the matter in my heart. Now let's go to Daniel 11. So I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him, and now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. Now, now remember, remember, in the fourth kingdom, the three horns had to fall before the one ever rose. That's what we're reading about. Now we've gone to the horns, the three horns that have to fall so the one can rise. Listen, and now we'll show thee the truth. This is Daniel 11, verse 2. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength and through his riches he shall stir up all against the realm of Gracia. And the mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven, not to his prosperity, nor according to his dominion which he ruled. So it's not going to be divided among that one country. But all across the world, here we go. All across the world. Did you hear that? It says, when he shall stand up, his kingdom is going to be broken. And it's going to be divided towards the four winds of heaven. That means all over the earth. And not to his prosperity, nor according to his dominion, nor according to the places he ruled. No. It's going to be divided or it's going to be all over the earth. For his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others beside those and the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion, and his dominion shall be great dominion. And in the end of years, they shall join themselves together, for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, that is the army. Neither shall he stand, nor his arm or army, but she shall be given up, and they that bought her, and they that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. This is historic. But out of the branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and also shall carry captives into Egypt their gods. Remember in the book of Joel, the robbers of thy people. Remember that term, the robbers of thy people, in the book of Daniel and in the book of Joel and in the, uh, some other books that also states the same thing. It's giving you a hint here. This is a primer. We've not gone over yet, but it's a, 
It's a pretty strong one. Let me read it again. Daniel 11, 8. And shall also carry captives into Egypt, their gods. Whose gods are Egypt? Or we're going to have to have a history lesson. Shall carry captives into Egypt, their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land, but his sons shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and shall be stirred up even to his fortress. And the king of the south shall be moved with collar or hanger and come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. And when he, when he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted, and he shall cast down many ten thousands. But he shall not be strengthened by him. This is still history. For the king of the north shall return and set up forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. And in those times... There shall be many stand up against the king in the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision. But they shall fall. You know, we've had some pretty big world wars. Why does no one correlate the world wars in this Bible? Especially World War II. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you something, right? Because I wondered that when I was small. And so it was almost like, you know, I had pretty good direction going into the Bible, seeing these overlapping events. I was telling the story of World War II. World War II defined or redefined the world. It reordered some things. Even after two lost civilizations that were on this earth that were covered up, see, history has missing elements. It does. It has missing elements, missing times. If some things are missing, once, we, once they are reintroduced, the story becomes easier or easier to see. It's very consistent. I mean, it's extremely consistent. Let's continue to read them. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him, and he shall stand in the glorious land which by his hand shall be consumed. He shall also set his face to enter in with the whole strength of his whole kingdom, and the upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. He shall give him the daughter of woman corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side either before him. The daughter of woman corrupting her. This is Now we're talking about nations here, right? And, and when you're talking about nations, having their origins and what came out of those, you know, places is important to you. And any of you history buffs, all you have to do is revisit the stories of World War II and World War I, and you can start to see this. It's, it's quite amazing because in the Middle East, a lot of World War II took place. And, and sometimes we forget that. We do. People forget about Rommel, right? They forget about that. They forget about the nations. They carried a holy banner, and some of them were wiped out during that time. The enraged ones from the south and the north. The joining of the armies in the Middle East who over... I mean, it's, it's, it is a, it is a, it's something else. It really is. It is something else. Let's continue. It says... But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. He shall also set his face to enter in with the strength of his whole kingdom, and the upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. He shall even give them the daughter of woman corrupting her. But she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. After this shall he return his face to the to, unto the isles, and shall take away many. Now that's an event you should highlight right there. Daniel 11.18, you should highlight that. Because you'll find it. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles, and shall take away many, but a prince for his own behalf shall cause a reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. So after all this, he stumbles, he falls, he is not found. You ought to highlight that too. I certainly have it highlighted. Daniel eleven nineteen. that can historically be found also. 
then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed neither in anger nor in battle. Now let me stop. You're talking about people rising by proxy, but, but more specifically you're talking about one country, one province. And that province is where something comes out of. This is what I'm getting at. It's in this province this um, Antichrist figure comes out of. Not in the places that one would usually think this province he is. Let me tell you to read. So one stands up. He stumbles and falls and is not found. In his place, a raiser of taxes and the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. That's two that fell. Two died, two are gone. Then it says, in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. This will get you. This is something... Daniel eleven twenty one. Listen to this. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give honor of the kingdom. Well, who has the authority to give the honor of a kingdom to anybody? Government. Not the people, but government. Do you hear me? Government. Why do I say government? Because they won't give him the honor of the kingdom. Government. But listen, it says, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. What's a flattery? A flattery is when you tell somebody something they want to hear. Now, here's my distinction. You have some places that never ever form this way. Well, many places never ever form this way. There's an incident involving people, three specifically coming in by proxy and is found nowhere else in the world. Nowhere else. So, in his estate shall stand up a vile person, this person is vile, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. What kingdom? Where did all of this come out of? The one who turned his face to the isles. But a prince on his own behalf shall cause reproach offered by him to cease, and without his own reproach shall cause it to turn upon him. So his own policy is turned against him, and he died, and then this first one stands up, and he stumbles and falls, is not found in his place. Somebody else stands up. But he, within a few days, he's going to be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. Then another stands up. Listen to me. That means no election. These people are being put in the power because somebody else died before them. Have elections in America. Nobody is put into place by proxy. We keep electing people. Nobody is put into power by proxy. We keep electing people, don't we? That disqualifies our process. This person does not come up this way. This person comes into power because he stands in the place of the one who fell before him. Okay? Now, he's right here in your Bibles. All right, let me continue. So, this vile person, he comes in peaceably. He obtains the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him. In other words, totally overtaken. And shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Daniel eleven twenty two shows you something. When he comes into power, not only does he break those in his own place, those in his own province, but also the prince of the covenant. Now, there's only one covenant. This person affects the prince of the covenant. Keep in mind, this covenant is a holy covenant. There's but one holy covenant on the earth that the Bible would ever call holy, that an angel would ever call holy, and that's Israel. Only Israel. So this thing, this individual, not only takes charge in his own country, because two people died before, likely through his own family, and he changes the people by his own methods, but he also, but he also flatters, probably flatters the prince of the covenant. Right? It says, with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him. That means you're overwhelmed with a type of goodness or, or something. You're overwhelmed with something. And they shall be broken. In other words, their resistance is no more. They don't resist anymore. When something is broken, when it says something is broken like that, that means your willpower to withstand is no more. You know, when you take a stance against somebody, well, if, if you are broken, right, in this context, 
then your willpower to stay resistant is no more. That means you no longer resist. You've given in. Okay? And it says, Yea, also the prince of the covenant. So Israel gave in. So that means Israel was standing against it when it first took place. They strongly stood against it. But then they gave in too. And indeed, history tells the truth. I tell you, you keep living, and the truth will always speak the truth. After Now listen, after a league made with him, shall he work deceitfully. Now, did it say he made the league? No. It said after a league made with him. What does that mean? Anybody? What does that mean after a league? I know the popular things that people say. You have to forgive me. I can't go with the popular things. I have to go with the word of God. I have to go with the word of God, not the popular things. Now, this word league simply means after they join him, they're going to join him. Right? And after a league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. Which means he won't see what he's really doing. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. You know what this seems to me to be like? Right? Imagine a person coming into power. But he comes into power, but his, his private people, his inner circle, gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Well, see, that's happening in the Middle East. That's been happening in the Middle East. We just don't go over international affairs enough that we would know the intricacies of all the kingdoms in the Middle East. And it really takes you doing your homework, but it's there. So he comes up, for he shall become, come up and shall become strong with small people. He shall enter peaceably, not by war, but peaceably, even upon the fattest places of the province. Now the word province is key, because province means the region. It does not mean the world. That does not mean the world. It means a region. It means a, a confined space. So he's not all over the world. He's within the region. He shall enter in upon the fattest or richest places upon the province. And he shall do that which his fathers have not done. Nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoil, the riches. Yea, he shall forecast his devices against strongholds even for time. Now listen, this is something you can see. He's going to scatter among them. Divide the prey, the spoils, and the riches. No one has ever done that before. Well, if no one ever did that before, you have to find that first time person who has distributed the wealth. That's what that means. That's what it means. He scattered among them the prey, the spoils, and the riches. Of what? Of the place he was ruling. So what does that mean? That means of every nation in the Middle East, right? They have their things from their historical things that are worth quite a bit of money, right? This person is distributing assets, enriching the people. He's causing the people to be quite prosperous. Very prosperous. Lots of prosperity. Oh my. He came up strong with a small people. He did what no one ever did. You know the Bible that says he's far richer than they all? My goodness, come on now. A brand new place at the end of time pops up. It starts out tiny. It's full of rich people. Richer than anybody who ever came before him. Richer than any place you could ever find. He scatters among them, distributes among them the prey, the spoils, and the riches. His fathers did not do that, so it's a first time thing. He even overcomes the prince of the covenant. That means, that means Israel wasn't buying it at first, but then they gave in. And even they have friendship with him. My, come on now, you have to wake up on this. Oh, well, you don't. You're going to know it anyway. You'll know it. I mean, you can go in the Middle East. There's a first time thing that never happened before over there. Nothing like it in the world, period. And it certainly did start being resisted. Even the person who did it, nobody would give that person the honor of the kingdom. But by flatteries, he convinced. Oh, man, let me not continue. Let me keep going. He shall enter peaceably upon the fattest places of the province. He shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey, the spoils, and the riches. Yea, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for time. So that means while he's building up his wealth, building up this new kingdom, this new place, he's also planning. He's planning something. 
against the strongholds of that area. So the whole time he's been building up his bank account, right? He's been plotting. Do you hear me? Plotting. He is loyal to something. It is in the person's family root. Let's continue to read. And it says, Yea, they that feed of a portion of his meat shall destroy him. That's a declaration. And that's an actual phrase of consequence that was used quite often back in these days. And it means that those who serve you now will be the same ones that destroy you. Right? The ones you dupe into your thing are going to be the same ones to take you down. Right? So, they that feed of a portion of his meat shall destroy him. The meat is what he speaks. Those who buy his rhetoric will be the same ones that destroy him. And his army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. I do not think we're here yet. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for the end shall be at an appointed time. Well, if they're speaking lies at one table, that's clearly politics. If in both those kings' hearts are to do mischief, then the, then the prince of the holy covenant at this time is not the good person you thought he was, because in their hearts is to do mischief against the other person. In other words, if, for example, if I were going to sit down at a table with another person and tell lies, then I'm negotiating. Negotiating is lies. Negotiating by way of Politics. Those are lies. Telling somebody what you're going to do. Telling somebody what your plans are. If they don't, if, if that conversation does not yield the discussion, it was a lie. So they, they purposely deceive each other in a conversation, and, but it's not going to prosper. They are purposely deceiving each other, but it's not going to prosper. And it says, after, after, it, it says, and he shall stir up his power. And his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south shall be stirred up to do battle with a very great and mighty army, but it shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Daniel 11.25 sounds just like something that would happen at the UN. Two armies, right, ready to fight, but then the UN steps in and says, no, nah, you know, you can't do that. And then it says, yea, they, well, we went over this, yea, they that feed of a portion of his meat shall destroy him. And his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. Now this, this context is, whoever this is, starts defeating things in the Middle East. They start defeating things in the Middle East. Listen, and both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. For the end shall be at an appointed time. Then shall I return to his land with great riches. And his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Now here's what you may not know. You may not know of the connections to some of these places in the Middle East. For example, who Saudi Arabia is loyal to, that's who they actually are. It's not like the proxies of Iran. You know of the Houthis and Hamas and Hezbollah and some others, but you may not know of those main countries that are hand in hand with Iran. And those main countries are friends of the whole world. So long as they keep it under wraps, right? People treat the one nation one way, but treat Iran like garbage. They don't know that by treating this other nation the good way, they're also treating Iran the good way. Why? Because in the back end, they're one and the same. They're sharing resources. One props up the other, and the other protects the other. One was missing an army, but Iran has an army. Isn't it funny? Well, you may not know the intricacies, but how Iran is so deeply involved in their peacekeeping operations. Funny thing. One of the richest places on earth. And at the appointed time, shall I return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter. For the ships of Shittim shall come against them. That's when it throws people off. The ships of Shittim. Right? Shall come against them. In other words, he won't be able to do what he wants because of some naval force. Now it says the ships of Shittim. It never said a specific country who owns those ships. That's not what it said. It's telling you that the ships in a specific place are going to be a deterrent from this individual 
pulling off what he wants to pull off. Did you hear me? Ships that are positioned in a certain place are deterrent. And so he can, he already knows he can't do. He can't employ the full plan, right? Because of those ships. It never said who the ships belonged to. It never said that. It just said the ships were there. And it says, For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do so his plans are to take his world down. He can't take his world down because there's a naval force in his way. That's it. If that's not a clear sign, see a lot of people, a lot of people, I know people have said, this is the Vatican, right? Does it sound like the Vatican? Who this individual is is so obsessed in hating Israel and he commands armies. But he's so obsessed, it's overtaken him. Everything he does now is for an activity against the Holy Covenant. He cannot have his way and it just makes him worse. I know a lot of people say, you know, well, you know, that, that this end time thing is the Vatican. Because when you start reading, if you just read half of this, then you might say, well, yeah, it could be anybody. But when you continue to read, it starts to disqualify folks, especially the military part, especially the obsession with the Holy Covenant, right? Then shall he return to his own land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the Holy Covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the appointed time he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or the latter, for the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them. That forsake the Holy Covenant. Now, this is the move. Daniel 11.30 is the move. This is the move that changes everything. Listen. The ships of Shittim come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and have indignation. Right? That's implacable hatred against the Holy Covenant. The Holy Covenant is Israel and the promise to Israel. So shall he do. And it says, here it is. He shall even return. He's going to come back have intelligence or knowledge shared plans with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So with all those in that province who hate Israel, he's going to be in cahoots with all those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Notice he uses the word forsake the Holy Covenant. Those who don't care about Israel. Those who will not choose Israel. What does that sound like? If you forsake the Holy Covenant, you're not mad at him. Now this guy, this 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 guy has indignation or hatred against the Holy Covenant. Okay? But so now what he does is he goes and talks to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Having indignation and forsaking are two different things. To forsake something means you've turned your back on it. You're not choosing it. But you're not actively, you know, obsessed with it either. This is a so what people, by their own belief, forsake the Holy Covenant? What people, by their own belief, forsake the Holy Covenant? What people, in their faith, always say Israel has no right to be there, but they're, in, they're, they're not going to move against Israel for that. But they're not for Israel. Huh? Come on now. It's, it's right there in front of your faces. The, this is what he joins himself to. So you said it. The faith is in the Middle East right now. It's the Muslim faith. And so he'll join his self to the radicalized part of the Muslim faith, those who have forsaken the Holy Covenant, to recruit them in their armies. What happens? Because it says he'll return and he'll have intelligence or plans with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. If we continue reading, it states, and arms shall stand on his part. And armies will be behind his command, his part, his plans, right? Armies are going to be behind it. What armies? Those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and take away the daily sacrifice and place the abomination that make it desolate. See how that works? So you got a nut job running around who is obsessed in his heart with a full hatred towards Israel. 
And all of what he does is to finally get to Israel, and so he recruits those who forsake the Holy Covenant. The armies join together, and with a combined effort, they come back towards Israel, but this time they take it. This time they don't lose, they take it. The last time the ships ran them away. The time before that, it wasn't as the former. It was a little different, but things didn't quite work out right, so he couldn't get to it. This time he does. This time he combines his indignation, his hatred, with all the militant forces who forsake the Holy Covenant. And they collectively, under his command, they collectively... They enter into Jerusalem, Israel, and then Jerusalem, and the horror begins. You see how much has to... Here's what I want you to see. Do you see what takes place before the abomination of desolation is set up? Now listen, or, or is the, this is for everybody out here. We read some things the other day that should have put everything in context. So now you know those in Judea must flee into the mountains before Christ returns. And they flee into the mountains... Because of the abomination of desolation of which we just read. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, let those in Judea flee into the mountains. Don't go back to take anything out of your houses. Don't go back to take anything. Run. Pray that your flight not be in winter. Pray that you're not with child that you, or woe unto them that are with child give suck in those days. Why? Because this has happened. Somebody says, sounds like Israel will never think the Antichrist is their Messiah. Let me, let me share this with you. I don't think they're going to think, they're not going to think this is the Messiah. They just talked to him at one table and they, they hated each other. So where does a false Messiah come from? Jesus told us something. And it's all under the umbrella of satanic planning. To wear somebody's faith down first. Matthew 24, we read that the other day. How disconnected that was from the Antichrist that many false prophets and it said false Christs will arise in the earth at that time taking full advantage these false imps taking full advantage of the weakness of a people so that when it because it is a false messiah it's gonna it's gonna dash their hopes like an explosion see because if, you, if somebody starts following something false and the greatest promises are not fulfilled, they actually believe. Then they find out it's false, they're truly going to be broken. Do you hear me? When, when anybody follows something false, yet it's something that they have been hoping for, for many generations. If they do follow it, they're truly going to be broken in the end. I mean, let me give you something that all you people can, all you folks can relate to. Imagine you meet your dream spouse. You finally met her. You don't know how it happened. At the same time you meet your dream spouse, something has happened to your real spouse. They're no longer on earth, so nothing's in your way. And it seems like such a divine thing. Then you get married to the person. Why? Because you're fully committed. You think it's an act from the Lord. You think it's a gift from the Lord. You're the happiest you've ever been. You're seeing nothing but brightness in your future. And then the person, when you wake up one day and that person says, Oh, I did this. Just so I can do something else. I don't even like you. I can't stand you. You find the truth out. You find out that your dream spouse was false. They never had love for you. They never cared for you. They never looked at you. They just simply used you. You're going to be crushed beyond the point of crushing. For anybody who would ever follow a false messiah, they're going to be crushed like no one else. Do you hear me? Why do you think Jesus warns us against false Christs because if we ever follow one we're going to be crushed so bad we may not recover do you hear me we may not recover so Jesus did what he warned us listen he said I've told you before I've told you before it ever happens there are going to be false Christs that will arise he emphasized he mentioned that too much because that would truly hurt somebody you shatter a person's faith you've got them you shatter a person physically, you don't have them. Faith is their resiliency. You shatter their faith. You've won. And everything Jesus told us was to keep our faith intact, not to hand it over. Because if it's ever crushed, then you are indeed crushed. So this, th these false Christs that rise, 
we're going to soften the blow because when when, the, when this happened, it's going to be the worst time there ever was, ever was. Didn't the Lord tell us that? The worst time that has ever been on the face of this earth, even worse than the flood that killed just about everything, even worse than all the wars that ever was, even worse than the grossest darkness anybody ever experienced, worse than Egypt and all of its plagues can be the worst time there ever was or would be again. There will be no other time like it after. And there was no other time like it before it. The Lord is giving us a severe warning and we live in those times. We live in those times. I'll take Robin's says break, so let me take a break. You guys getting anything from this? I hope that you are. Now right there where he goes in and he goes into Jerusalem. Now we have to read Revelation 13, okay? Her 13 says, after all of this, here we go. Revelation 13. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue for you in two months. Now remember, we're still talking about, in, in, in Daniel, this thing with armies went into Jerusalem and set up the abomination of desolation. In Revelation, we're reading about the first beast, just the first beast. Not the second. We're not reading about the second. We're reading about the first beast. It says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. This is Revelation 13, 2, added back up. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, seeing great authority. The dragon did. So again, he, the dragon essentially, somebody said he has to be Trump. You'll see in a minute. The dragon... Gave him his power seat and great authority. This is the first beast. And I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Now a lot of people have not read. If they think this is a human head. They haven't read Daniel. I mean, I mean uh, Revelation 17. Because Revelation 17 tells us exactly what this is. It is not a human being. It's not what it is. Right? Listen to this. Revelation 17, 8. And the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. They that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Revelation 17, 8 is not talking about a human being at all. I suspect I know exactly what it's talking about. I only suspect this. But it's not talking about a human being. It's talking about something akin, it is not, but it's akin to a sarcophagus. But a very different type of sarcophagus. And something is inside that wouldn't even fit in your house. And when people see it, they're going to wonder if they were ever human at all. How about that? They're going to wonder if they had any inheritance, any relationship to human beings here on this earth. How about that one? You see, again, there's some unknown elements that uh, the world has not been introduced into yet, but they will. And when it comes, it's going to change your entire view of Revelation, of the book of Daniel. It's going to change your view of just about everything. And then you will not be in the dark concerning end times events. And then you will not say, oh, that's conventional and this has to be conventional. And you're going to back away from that. You're going to say, nope, nope, because this is something. Just like the Lord said, be careful to entertain strangers because you entertain angels unaware. You have no discernment when it comes to this. And God did that on purpose. You don't even need it with this. You don't need it. You don't need it. it it's going gonna, it's gonna to mess up your lives. Thank God it will be at the end. Because if it happened, if it happened near the middle or something like that, not one of us, not one of us would communicate the way we are right now. Not society would be far different. There'd be a lot of fear on this earth. I mean, real fear. God knows what he's doing. He will allow you to see what you can handle. So if you have not seen it, you cannot handle it. Thank him for that. Don't get mad because you haven't seen something. Thank him that he's not going to allow you to see something that's going to just totally cause your life to spiral into darkness and death. All right? Now, Revelation 17 and here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. 
on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. This is also inclusive of the three that fell, and one who rose before him. Listen. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Now these are the human beings. The horns are human beings. The horns are human beings. The rest are not human beings. The horns are human beings. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as of yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Listen, we're not done. These have one mind and shall give their power and their strength unto the beast. Now, what do they mean, give it unto the beast? We're going to find out in Revelation 13. But as you can see, we're not talking about that this head is a mountain, a mountain is like a capital, right, of a place or a nation or a country. The horns are human beings. But no one has seen these horns as of yet. They haven't come out of, they're not revealed yet. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Listen, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords, King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he said unto me, the waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Peoples. What is the water? Because in Revelation 13, he stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And the beast has seven heads and ten horns and bones horns, ten crowns and bones heads and names of blasphemy. It's the same thing. The waters which thou sawest where the horse sitteth are the peoples, multitudes and nations and tongues. So where does this beast come out of? The people. The people. Plural. The people. What are we talking about? Nations. We're talking about the world. The first beast is of the world, of the people. Not one person, of the people. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. They don't like her, they hate her. These shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God should be fulfilled. That's called prophecy. So God put it in their hearts. God put it in the hearts of the ten kings who had no kingdom as of yet but willed one hour with the beast. God put it in their hearts. Render their power unto the beast, one hour with the beast, that the words of God should be fulfilled, that his prophecies will be complete. The devil did not put this in their hearts. God put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. My, you got people running around scared of the beast. You got people so frightened of revelation saying, well, I'm not going to endure that. The Lord's going to take me. You know, what are you talking about? Your father is the one who's doing this to close the process. Lord, help us get it. Help us get it. Because some, somebody out there, some dodo out there in history has turned Revelation into some fantasy horror book. Just like a dum-dum. That's not what it is. This is your father's process of revealing its closure to all things it is your victory and the way in which he has prescribed it to happen it's his prophecy why are people so scared so nervous why and then people make money off of it scaring people to pieces help us get it Lord. help us get it and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth the only way to understand that is to read Jeremiah See, God told somebody something about them reigning over the kings of the earth. How does she reign over the kings of the earth? By way of iniquity. Because so long as she would not repent, the kings of the earth would indeed be corrupted. Should she ever change her mind, the whole world would be healed. My goodness. Now, if that's not reigning over somebody, I don't know what is. It's kind of like you in the USA. It's kind of like you in Europe. It's kind of like you in your native country. If you who believe in God would humble yourselves and pray and, 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 and pray to him in truth, turn from your wicked ways, God would then hear from heaven and heal the land. So guess who's control over the fate of your respective country? You are. You have always been.
whether your country is broken or healed, that's on you. Should a people humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways? You just can't humble yourself and pray and stay the same way. You got to turn from your wicked ways when you do this. Then he would hear from heaven and he would heal the land. Who has power over a, over a country then? God's people do. They have power. Do you see how you've always had the power? Do you see? You've always had the power. And the Lord gave us specific instruction. But my goodness, you you know what I know, mankind is hard-headed. They're hard-headed. God told us exactly what to do. He said, humble yourselves and pray, turn from your wicked ways. That's what he said. We can't even do that. You know, it's like, it's like a doctor. If a doctor says, listen, I just sewed your arm back on. Don't take the bandage off until next Saturday. You say, okay, but I got a game on Wednesday. You're going to do it your way anyway. So when he gets infected and falls off, whose fault is it? The doctor's fault? No. Everything God does, he ends it with instruction. If you want the glory of God to, to rain down in your life, then keep his instructions. But what normally happens is these advocates of iniquity come and they give these weird instructions that are not of the most high. They sound like they would work, but they never work. That's why we're in the mess we're in now. Because we've been following things that sound like they'll work. Oh, they're logical. Oh, it fits. But the outcome is sure. Get it. That's why God has opposed this process. I mean, we're late in the game now. We're just now waking up the truth. You know why? Because we can't hold on to the falsehoods we have in the past. Haven't you noticed that humanity will only accept the truth when they are proven wrong? In other words, all of us had a way within us. And until it failed over and over again, we would not accept the truth for the truth. We heard the truth in the beginning, but we added our two cents to it. Well, I think it's this and I think it's that. Then you end up in this horrible position and then you sit back by yourself saying, well, it must not be that. It must not be what I thought it was. I surrender, Lord. That's what we do until we're proven wrong. We poke our chests out, stand in pride, and say we are right. And then when it blows up in our faces, when it doesn't work out, when we're the, we're the ones to pay the penalty, then we surrender. Slump down in a corner like Charlie Brown and say, Oh, Lord, I've been so stubborn. See, we know what we are. I knew a person, they said, listen. I'm allergic to, to, they were allergic, what was it, uh, hot sauce. And they told everybody they were allergic to hot sauce. So we go out to eat one day and the guy says, oh, damn me, I got to get some hot sauce. I thought you were allergic to it, I know, but I just love it so much. You, you, dumb dumb, you dumb dumb, you would suffer the results of being allergic to something just to have the flavor in your mouth for a second and put yourself through that. His throat swole up. Eyes bulge. I mean, he looked just terrible, right? He was a white guy that then looked like he was a black guy afterward. That's not right, right? Why would you put yourself through that if you already know you're allergic to it? Just stay away. But there's something in us that won't allow us to do the simple thing. We've got to add our two cents and stand on it like it's the absolute truth and then when the whole foundation falls out we sit in a corner like Charlie Brown Lord I've been stubborn because we know we've been stubborn Lord I didn't listen because we know we didn't listen Lord I tried to make it work my way because we know we disobeyed him we do things like that knowingly not in ignorance this is knowingly so when things break down over time we all start surrendering. Then we start reading with different eyes. Not our, well, they're not reading because we followed some popular author and believed his idea over the living God's idea. Or our sister should say over the living God's declaration. Because some of the people in the past, they totally got it all messed up. They did. Why? Because truth is eventually revealed. All we had to do was wait. All we had to do was be patient. And if we didn't have the truth, then we don't have the truth. How simple is that to say, I don't know? We have a problem with saying, I don't know. We do. Can I pick on you ladies? Just like ladies have a problem saying anything if you tell them to say it. If you tell a woman to say something, 
something rises up within them, they will not do it. They will not. They won't do it. They'll do everything but that. Right? They'll say everything but that thing. Don't worry, ladies. I respect you. But I'm just using this because it's, uh, it's something you know about. And it's something that men happen to know about, too. It's kind of like a simple answer. You say, uh, did you, did you, uh, did you lock the front door? Well, let me tell you what happened first. Well, what, I just want an answer to the first question. Did you lock it or not? Well, wait a minute. Let me give you this story. What story? Is the door locked? Yes or no? Well, just, are you going to listen to my story? Isn't that the way it goes? That's the way it goes. It, it's, we are inherently in a battle. We are. Inherently in a battle. And it's in us. It's in us all. We do things to that extent, and while it may sound comical, when it comes to our faith, it has put lumps and bumps all over us. I call those knowledge knots. That's when you get hit in the head. You remember the cartoons and somebody got hit with a mallet and a big bump would grow in their head? That's a knowledge knot. I know about those very well. Let's continue. This thing, now that you know what it is, back to Revelation 13. Now let me read 13 for you. And there was given power unto him mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months 40 and two months so we had this deadly wound right he, it, as i saw one of the heads as it were wounded to death and this deadly wound was healed and the world wondered after the beast and they worshiped now wonder means they were in awe after the beast they were in awe after the beast. Revelation 13, 4. And they worshipped the dragon. This is disturbing. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Let me stop. They, you know who the dragon is. The dragon is that old serpent, the devil. Right? The world worshipped the dragon. That not disturbing. The world worshipped the dragon. Now see, a lot of people, they think about the beast. Yeah, they're going to worship the Antichrist, this, that, and the other. But it says here, they worshipped Lucifer, the world worship Lucifer. How so is my question. Uh oh, see, this is what I have to unpack. The world worshiped Lucifer. How so? How did the world do it? Now remember, Jesus said, love not the world. What he said? He said, if you love the world, the love of God is not in you. Why? Because the world worships the dragon. How does it worship the dragon? It has wholly embraced its ways. It's not that they're going out there saying, oh, hail, you know, Satan or Lucifer. No, 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 no. To worship something is to voluntarily observe, keep its ways. When we worship, to worship God is also to keep his ways. Do you know that? That's why Jesus said, we, God is spirit. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. When you keep the ways of the Most High. You worship the most. Most people think worship is just saying, oh, thank you, you just wonderful, and that's it. No. Dig into that word, worship. You'll find out what it is. You'll find out it's a state of a person. You know, when, the, you know, when Jesus said, men aren't always praying. You remember when he said, pray without ceasing. How in the world do you do that? It's the way you walk, the way you live your life. So you can pray without ceasing. You can pray without ceasing. And worship is something that comes from within a person. They worshipped the dragon. It came from within them. Why? You ready? Of all things that men love, they love to fight. They love the fight. They like to make someone lose. Why do you say that? Because they have to be the winner. If you like being a winner, then you also like someone to lose. They always have to have a foe of their own kind. They target one another and they'll do so. They love to struggle for the sake of the struggle. They love the carnage of competition. The carnage. They like to revel in their feats at overcoming and having dominion over others. The, all these are the ways of Satan, not of the living God. God is authority. God is truth. God is at the top of everything. His delight, he already told us what his delight was. We like to be right. We love to be right, don't we? That's a big one. So does Satan. Everything in this system is designed 
I mean, it's designed perfectly to cause a person to live after the manner of the dragon and not of the living God. It's influence. When you come to terms with those things, you really find out you like them. Small things, small things, like sports. Everybody likes, most people like sports, right? I can honestly tell you something, and it doesn't mean, you know, I'm just a weirdo, so that's all. I was, I'm, I played football, okay? I did. And I was into it because I was highly competitive. Oh, I was so highly competitive. I was highly competitive. And I'll tell you something else, I did not like to lose. I didn't like my team to lose. I had a conflict. I did not like to see a person defeated. I didn't. I never, I hate to see a person defeated. When, when I was coming up, there were certain things I would never watch because someone had to lose. And I never liked someone to lose. You know what they used to tell me? That's part of life. Someone always has to lose. I, I know that. I just don't like to see it. I cannot clap for someone who won because I can't overcome the sadness of somebody losing. It always pulled at me more than winning. Now, I don't entertain any of those things. I can't deal with it. I don't like it. There's something in me against it. But it wasn't always like that. No, 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 no. You bring, you tell me I couldn't do something, that's the very thing I was going to do. Right? Somebody said they were fast or, you know, they could do something better than I could. Oh, well, there's a competition. Let's go find out. That was me. Head first. I mean, right into it. But I didn't like to see people lose. Didn't like to see people lose. And it would always mess up. It would stop me from winning. Controversy. But now I know why. I know why. People, they stand up when somebody runs over somebody else. They, because to win is to win by a specific method in this world, and we all know it. You're not going to win until you knock your opponent down. It is the knockout that causes that courageous win. It is the death of another that perpetuates the stories of heroes. That's the way the world is made. It is designed this way. Because when I first read this, the world... It said, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power into the beast? Okay, that means they worshipped Satan. Are you kidding? And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power into the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? That's bragging. You know what they're saying? Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? That's just like saying, who's like your favorite person in the world? Who's like, you know, my president? No one can make war with him. Who's able to take down this person? Who's able to defeat my favorite team? These are people bragging on the beast with a mentality that's in the world right now. Can you see that? Can you all see that? Because it says, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him. Now, of course, they're not saying beast at all. They just have this bravada in them, which, which for their specific thing, the pride, the bragging, always touting, my team is going to win and they're going to lose. That is woven into mankind and is uttered here at the end of times from the world. This is what the world utters. I want you to see that. It's not that everybody is saying, who is like unto the beast and, and hail Satan. No, 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 no. No, but the ways of Satan... And the ways of the beast are in this world, and people love it so. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That word continue means to finish. So we're not talking about a start and finish, because that word threw me off when I first read this. To continue forty and two months... It's to complete a task within that time. That's what the language is in the Greek. To complete a task within a specific time, which means you already have to be in the task. Right? It's like you at work, and then somebody says, hey, you have two hours to finish this job. Well, you have to be at work to even receive that type of announcement. 
right? So when it says, if power was given unto him to continue, it means he already started. It didn't say to start and to finish in 42 months. It said to continue, which means he already started. This process has already begun. Now, once you see this, Satan gave this thing his power seeking great authority. That power seeking great authority is in the earth right now. There's something that marks the presence of a satanic power in the earth quite clearly. Something we'll talk about in a minute an hour. Something that is undeniable. And it's going to get far worse. I want you guys to see this. Revelation 13, 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. You know what? Could this be happening right now? Yes, it could. A mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. What speaks louder than the Internet and communication over the Internet? It's not that one person is speaking to everybody. It's that an ideology has gone forward and has spoken to everybody on a continuous basis. On a continuous basis, these rotten ideologies are reaching that point of singularity against the living God. Not for him, against him. What we're doing is, 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 nobody wants us to do this. The natural state of mankind is against this. To have a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies is to have that to be acceptable in the world and spoken one to another freely. The great mouth, this is the first time we've had this internet, right? I'd say it's a pretty big mouth and it's, it can speak to all of us at the same time. Think about that. What bigger mouth? than something that can speak to all of us at the same time. And it speaks continuously. There is no bigger mouth. No one has a bigger mouth than the internet. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. We see that everywhere. To blaspheme his name, yep. His tabernacle, yep. And then that dwell in heaven, yes. All of them. A big mouth on a continuous basis speaking this stuff. You can always hear it. If you're listening for it, you can hear it. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. I'd say right now, if you truly believe in Christ, you know it's a dark world. But how do you know it's a dark world? Because of your own personal life, that's how. Because of your personal life, that's how. Something has been against you. It's almost as if something has prospered against you. Don't think it's an accident. It's part of your father's process, just like when he put in the hearts the ten kings to give their power unto the beast, one hour with the beast, that the words of God should be fulfilled. Same thing. He promised us, Jesus promised us trials and tribulations. He did. He, he gave us a promise that we would have them. And they, the only way we can have trials and tribulations to have an element in the world that would try us like that is to have a dark element in the world, like Satan. And Jesus was to be tempted into the wilderness, and he was drawn into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost, who was there to fulfill the tempta tempting of Jesus. Satan was, right? God doesn't tempt us, nor can he be tempted, but Satan does. In the Old Testament, God said, I created the good and the evil, so you better, don't be scared, but you better believe. Satan is fulfilling a purpose for your victory and he can't do anything about it. Isn't that funny? He can't do anything about it. This guy is evil. He fell from grace a long time ago and he's still being used for your personal victory. And there's nothing he can do about it. So stop running around scared. There's a Messiah over your life. Don't run around scared as though he's in power to something. There's an absence of something that people just, they, they refuse to identify, don't worry. They were to, I'm not holding those things back. Listen, it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them, and power was given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Why is everybody going through the exact same thing? Mm -hmm. Why? The whole world drawn in to the same situations. And it's almost like they cannot escape. The continual bombardment of darkness. Nobody can. Nobody. It's like a sickness or cancer or something like that. Things reach out and touch us. We're all exposed to the same common things. Oh, by the way, 
In order for this prophecy to be fulfilled, you had to be able to confirm it, no matter what country you're from. Isn't that awesome? So, we had to have this platform for you to be able to confirm that the Word of God is coming to pass in the first place. I want to know what time you're in. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So if your name is not in the book of life, you worship him. And it is true right now. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. Even of those in the church, there's some you just, you think, oh, maybe their name is not in there, boy, because their activities are not conducive of somebody written in the book of life. So there's no gray area anymore. There used to be. There used to be a time you could see a person in a true dilemma. There was even a space, it seemed, that a person could make a choice, but now it truly is hot or cold. It's almost like the lukewarm have truly vanished. Because haven't you noticed the people who hesitate in that full commitment to the Most High end up attacking those who believe in the Most High? Haven't you found that out? Haven't you found that out? Have you seen the visceral response you get from some of these people? Have you seen it in their faces, in their conversations, in their blasphemous conversations? And most of the people, anyway, hopefully you guys can see it. It says, it says, if any man hath an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Remember when Jesus said, in your patience possess ye your souls. So we have an answer. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, what does this mean in the time of this darkness? Listen to me. Because the power seeking great authority of the dragon is now in the kingdoms of this earth. Remember, the kingdoms of this earth are not the kingdoms of our Lord. But they will be. Because later on in Revelation, it states the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So that means right now they do not belong to him. Remember when Satan tempted Jesus, you cannot tempt the Son of Man, the source of truth, with a lie. So Satan told him the truth. He said, see these kingdoms? He showed him all the kingdoms in a moment of time. And he said, I will give these to you if you worship me. They have been given to me, and I can give them to whomever I will. So what does that tell you? You were born in a world where these kingdoms did not belong to the living God. And if they don't belong to God, they do indeed belong to Satan. Why would you expect them to promote the living God? They have always fought Christ and those with the message of Christ. Always. It's just a whole lot worse now because the main man is coming forward. Now, by the way, this is all the first piece. Now, here it is. And then, then I'm going to have to let you go. Maybe, maybe not. Revelation 13, 11. I beheld and another beast coming up out of the earth. Here's another beast, a second beast. Stay with me. This was the first beast. This was, these were the systems in the earth. This, the first beast came out of the people of the earth. These are nations. That's what the first beast was. Now we're reading about the second beast. And I beheld and another beast coming out, out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. What does that mean? Two horns as a lamb. His appearance was connected to something of holiness or a person of faith. That's what the two horns of a lamb mean. He did not come from the people. He came out of the land. The implications of that stand on a merit all by themselves. He did not come from the people. But he spake as a dragon. Well, if the dragon gave the first beast his power seeing great authority, and those are the systems of this world, and the systems of the, the kingdoms of this world are obsessed with politics, Come on now, because that's all they speak to each other is politics, politics, politics. Specific ways of speech. Then we know then to speak like a dragon is to have the speech of a politician. That peculiar speech of the world right now. You know, when you're, when you're intelligent, you're supposed to speak a specific way. You're supposed to be politically correct all over the world. Doesn't matter what language you speak. All over the world. 
Doesn't matter what language you speak. There's certain courtesies and, you know, things you do. That's right, Draconian, that's where it came from. But these are in the earth, right? These are in the earth. So to speak that language of these governors and presidents and leaders that really love these kingdoms and systems is to have a Draconian tongue. What am I saying? What kind of speech does a politician speak? They speak a legal speech. The speech of rules. Just like ancient Babylon. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar? How did King Nebuchadnezzar speak? He spoke by the law. And he was, he was a tyrant, yes. But he was a tyrant of great integrity. He kept his word. King Nebuchadnezzar was a heartless, ruthless tyrant. He was a man of integrity. And he kept his word. But make no mistake, he was a murderer. Ruthless, but he was bound by the law. Babylon was known by the law. That law exists to this day. And people keep it as called the rule of law. This is part of an earth-based system. Let's continue to read about this verse. So, so I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. If you have the appearance of a holy person, well, that changes everything. That puts you right in the Middle East, honestly. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. And he causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they, that listen, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by sword, by war, and did live. They should make an image to the nation that had a wound by war, but lived, not some person. So you have a second beast telling the world to make an image to the first beast. See, a lot of people have not even, they don't read this. They haven't seen this. So what do we have so far? We have a beast, an established system in the world. Then we have someone who comes up from the land who causes people to make an image to the first beast. So what he does is he brings the first beast into the view of the people. The people already loved the first beast. They worshipped the first beast. But this guy comes to sit at the top of the food chain of the first beast. Let me call the beast the kingdoms of this world, just like Daniel uh, saw it for us. They are the kingdoms of this world. That's what the beast is. The kingdom, the last kingdom on earth is that beast. And this thing comes out from the earth, not from the people. The first beast came out of many people's tongues and languages. The second beast comes out from the land. And he has two horns like a lamb, L-A-M-B, and speaks a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast. And he causes those who dwell on the earth to make an image to that beast. And he does supernatural things. He does supernatural things, listen, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in sight of men. Now, I don't think that's a great wonder, but it puts it in context. If the Bible just said, and he doeth great wonders, we can interpret that to be anything. But it doesn't. It said, and he doeth great wonders. So that means it's giving you reasoning behind it. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in sight of men. So he's doing the literal miracles. And people are following him because of the miracles he's able to do. You find, now, is there a person who can do miracles? Yes. Yep. You better believe it. You better believe it. Like one you'll see is this person will touch his palm in any place in the sand and water starts flowing. Especially in this, in this type of environment when all the wells have run dry. But this person can do it right now. So if he can do it, then out of his lineage, you know it's got to be more just like him with even greater gifts. False gifts, but gifts nonetheless. The second beast is going to do miracles in sight of people. People are going to follow this thing because of the miracles he's able to do 
in front of everybody. It's not going to be some hidden thing he'll do. He will demonstrate his abilities before all. Before every... See, we forget about that fact. You got a lot of people running around saying, this person is the Antichrist, that person. Not one of them has done any type miracle. And when we see the Antichrist come onto the scene, the beast will have been established already. And he will take a seat. And he will be introduced by doing those miracles. You can read... You can see that in the development of this person when he comes forward. He's going to overcome the people in a way that nobody else has been able to do it before him. See, so the qualifications for this, this second beast, by the way, is the Antichrist. Let me show you how before I go. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth inside of men. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles that which he had power to do inside of the beast. So that's how he deceived the world, by means of the miracles. Let me continue to read. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast, which hath a wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and to cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So he is the one that introduces the mark. And it causeth all, both small and great, rich, poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. So this second beast is the Antichrist that everybody's looking for. Guess what else he is? He is the false prophet. Lord have mercy. Oh, see, I just threw you for a loop. Don't worry. It's these people in the past who wrote these popular books and movies and just messed everything up. Because listen, there's the devil, which is the dragon. There's the first beast. And there's the second beast. There's no one else. You have the devil, which is the first, which is the, the main character. You have the first beast. You have the second beast with two horns like a lamb, religious figure, Antichrist, false prophet. The Antichrist is the false prophet. The false prophet is the Antichrist. That's what you're calling the Antichrist. He is the personification of this kingdom that's on the earth. He is the king of the kingdom that's on the earth. He is the interface to humanity that's on the earth of this kingdom. The first kingdom is not the Antichrist because it's, it, 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 it is comprised of a bunch of people, nations, tongues, and languages. That's not the Antichrist. That's a system. And this second beast who comes out of the earth, not of the people, who has two horns like a lamb and speaks as a dragon, who's able to do miracles and all this, that is the Antichrist. And it just so happens the Antichrist is a false prophet for the first beast. Did you hear what I just read? He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth inside of men. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles that he had power to do in sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he, listen, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That's a false prophet. That is a false prophet who is causing people to worship the first beast. Prophets cause people to worship things, and he's causing people to worship the first beast. He, causes, he tells the people that they should make an image to the first beast. That's what he tells the world. You see? I know it's like come to steal because we have all these ideologies we're stuck with. It's right here in front of us. You guys know about those three unclean spirits? The three unclean spirits, you guys know about that? Who can be the image of the beast? Well, it's the same reason that in my heart of hearts, I have a high hope that Russia will disengage any fighting immediately. Because they're not fighting a human being. It's the same reason. Now, some of you know exactly what Russia's fighting. And we're not talking about, we're, we're, we're not talking about, you know, some spirits or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. We're talking about something man-made. We're talking about a breakthrough of breakthroughs. It's been in operation for the last four months. It's the reason they continue to throw money at this thing. They're not throwing money. How you think? They're not. Trust me. That's money well spent for, for, for something so dark. And if I were Russia, I would discontinue any military opera. I wouldn't even let anything over there see me fight. Mm -mm. All you have to do is think Terminator. That's all. Just think Terminator. That's all you have to do, because there are certain things on this earth which can learn in 30 seconds what it takes a human being 15 years to learn. It's learning operational things that are invaluable. It's being trained in ways that nobody else can do it, and it's fully engaged 
and it's running the whole show. You could put the thing in the back of your car. It's running. When I say running the whole show, I mean running the whole show. I already know what the name of the thing is. You just don't know the project name. It's out there. It's a betrayal. In my opinion, it's a betrayal. It's an absolute betrayal. Anyway, you guys see this with the with the uh, the two beasts. You see with the two beasts, there's are three components, of which the three unclean spirits came out of one out of the mouth of the dragon, one out of the mouth of the beast, and one out of the mouth of the false prophet. See that? Out of the mouth of the dragon, who is the dragon? Satan had one of those unclean spirits in him. Out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, nobody else. They didn't come out of nobody else. And we just read in Revelation 13 who those three components are. There is no one else. There is the dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. See, it kind of changes everything. When the Antichrist, the one who causes everybody to take the mark, is also the one causing everybody to worship the first beast. Do you see it? The same one that causes everybody to take the mark is the same one that causes everybody to worship the first beast. He's the one that told the world to make an image to the first beast. He's the one that was able to give power to that image, that it would kill as many as would not worship it. So you have Satan, the first beast, and the second beast. Those are the ones the three unclean spirits came out of. One out of the mouth of the dragon, one out of the mouth of the beast, and one out of the mouth of the false prophet. The false prophet is the one that with two horns like a lamb. You know what a lamb is? Jesus came as a lamb. So now you have this counterfeit thing coming to the earth like that. Working miracles. Uh-oh, you guessed it. It's exactly what's been expected right now to come forward and when it does he who now letteth will be taken out of the way then that wicked will be revealed only then not before but before he gets here the world they were always going to worship the dragon and worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him but I'll tell you something and before I go. There's something on this earth right now you'll never win a war against and nobody can kill it. It's on the earth right now. It's been given life and nobody can kill it. Nobody. And people do worship it. Meaning, people do honor it and they keep it alive. But it is empowered of itself. And it has dominion over people. COT's base of operations is right here at thecouncilftime.com. COT has no other outlet or venue. These are other folks who will rebroadcast. Anything COT does is by the main page here at thecouncilftime.com. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boastful, proud, blasphemous. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? If you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.